اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین و صلی اللہ علی سیدنا محمد و علیہ طاہری ورس نمبر ایٹ فرام سورہ بقرہ و من الناس من یقول آمنا بالله و بالیوم الآخر و ما هم بمؤمنین And among the people are those who say we have faith in Allah and the last day, but they have no faith. This is the beginning of uh, a discussion about the third category of the people. As you believe, as, as you remember, uh, the first category of people were those who had faith, al-muttaqoon, who were guided by the Quran. The second category who had chosen not to believe, And therefore, whether you warn them or you do not warn them, it is not going to, to avail, to give any benefit. Now, the third group are the munafiqoon. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ They say we believe in God and the Day of Judgment, and they are not believers. Now, here we are going to, uh, to discuss 13 verses about the munafiqoon. We had just a couple of verses about, uh, just two verses about uh, disbelievers, a couple of verses about the mu'minun, and now 13 verses about disbelievers, uh, the hypocrites. And the reason is, as I said, because this is the, the f- these are the v- first verses revealed in Medina, and now the prophet faces with a new phenomenon, and that, as, that is hypocrisy. In Mecca, we didn't have any hypocrisy because there, there was no place for hypocrisy, actually. We had taqiyya, on the other hand, because many believers did not reveal their faith, did not uh, manifest their faith on, from the fear of the kuffar. Here, many people who do not believe uh, show that they believe. They just uh, pretend they believe because of the benefits that it may bring for them. Okay, from among the people... There are those who say, Amanna billah wa bil yawm al-akhir. Now, these two things which are put together, faith in Allah and the Day of Judgment, are the two pillars of faith. One without the other would not work. Of course, no one believes in the Day of Judgment without Allah. But people, there are some people who believe in Allah but do not believe in the Day of Judgment. And there are certain people who do not believe in Allah as someone who should they follow. Now, in the, in the belief of the mushrikun of Mecca and Medina, they believed in Allah, but they did not believe that they have to follow his commands. They did not believe that Allah sustains them. They believed that the idols would sustain them. So Allah was just the creator, so sublime, so high that He, he didn't have any intervention with the creation. So they didn't have anything to do with Allah at all. What was important was to actually appease and satisfy the idols so that the idols would give them whatever they wanted. Worship was a bargain. Why it was a bargain? Because there was no spirituality. And there was no belief in the Day of Judgment. The Mushrikun of Mecca, you see in the Quran, they did not believe in the Day of Judgment. They did not believe in life after death at all. وَزَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا وَنَسْيَ خَلْقَهَ قَالَ مَنْ يُحْيَ الْعِظَامِ وَهِيَ رَمِيمِ They give us an example, and they bring a bone and say, who would give life to this after death? And there are many, many examples in the Quran, many verses in the Quran, which shows that the Mushrikun of Mecca and Medina did not believe in the Day of Judgment like many other people, many other idolaters who did not believe in the Day of Judgment. There were many idolaters who believed in the Day of Judgment, like, for example, in Egypt. The Egyptians had very comprehensive and uh, detailed idea about life after death, what happens, and that's why, you see, they embalmed their death and they, uh, they made all those pyramids and such things for the pharaohs because they had detailed uh, uh, belief in the day of judgment, they believed in one day which everyone would come before before gods or, or the supreme god. But in the case of Meccans, they did not believe in the day of judgment. Now, they did not believe in Allah 
in the sense that they did not feel that they have to follow him, they have to obey him, and uh, he did not intervene in this world. So th these two, as the pillars of faith, they say, يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Both of them, وَمَا هُمْ Is someone who, would we say someone who believe in Allah, Nowadays, we have many people who believe in God, but they don't believe in anything else. They say, okay, we believe that there is a creator in this world, but they don't believe in anything else. Do we regard this, these people as believers? Not believers in, of course, Islam, but believers, generally believers in, in whatever God accepts as faith. Apparently, the Quran does not accept belief in God without belief in Akhirah. They go hand in hand, because if... We believe in God and do not believe in life after death. We are accusing God of doing void and uh, unreasonable, uh, committing unreasonable acts. Because creating this world, bringing human beings to, to this world, and they do whatever they want and then they die, is actually accusing God of not having wisdom. It's accusing God of, of a stupidity. And therefore, they go hand in hand. In Surah Haqqa and in Surah Waqa, when Allah speaks about uh, day of, of course, it's all Qiyamah, day of judgment, and all these things, at the end of both surahs, it says, "Inna hada lahu haqqul yaqeen." In Surah Waqa, or in Surah Haqqa, it says, "Wa inna hu lahaqul yaqeen." What I say is utter truth, and then it says, "Fasabbih bismi Rabbik al -azim. So purify the name of your Lord of creating something which is void, which is useless, which has no purpose whatsoever. Purify the name of your Lord of this. Therefore, if someone does not believe in Akhirah, the faith in God alone is not very useful. Not because, for example, it would not deter them from doing bad things. There are many people who do not believe even, even in God, but they are good people. They, 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 are the, they have conscience and such things. However, because belief in, disbelief in Akhirah is accusation, an accusation against God that he is doing void and uh, unreasonable thing, uh, and it follows that many people who do not believe in Akhirah commit many wrong things as well. Now, in... Uh, in Surah Fussilat, one very main issue which is mentioned about the disbelievers if, is that they do not believe in Akhirah, about Mushrikun, especially Mushrikun of Mecca. They do not believe in Akhirah. فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ أَلَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ أَلَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةِ وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِهُمْ كَافِرُونَ Here, mushrikun are identified not as those who do not believe in God, not as those who do not follow God or obey Him. الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةِ Those who do not give away whatever they have in charity, do not share with other people. This is one, one very important pillar of faith as well. وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِهُمْ كَافِرُونَ And they are kuffar in akhirah. So, belief in God and Day of Judgment are two pillars of faith that cannot be separable, they cannot be separated from each other. Although we had in even some Abrahamic religions, we have certain sects who did not believe in Akhra uh, in the Day of Judgment. Like, for example, the, the Sadduqis in, uh, in, in old Judaism and some modern Jews as well, they do not believe in, in life after death. Well, I don't know how, how this is possible. I mean, uh, despite all those uh, uh, indications in the Bible, but there have been people who have denied that. Uh, the belief in Akhirah as well, one other thing that we can add is that the belief in Akhirah has indicators. It's not just saying that, okay, it's a tenet of our faith that we believe in Akhirah, and that's it. No, it has indicators. You may say, I believe in Akhirah, but in reality, you do not believe in Akhirah. And that is what is mentioned in the Quran as well, in, in other verses of the Quran. For example, Do you know who rejects 
the day of judgment. Deen is judgment. Do you know who rejects the day of judgment? This is the one who drives away, who rebukes Yatim, the orphan. Those who do not encourage people to give food to the poor. Meskin. These Musallin, of course, are hypocrites. So, woe to those who pray while they, their prayer is just a hypocrisy. They do not pray properly. And therefore, in many other verse, verses, these two have come together. They don't do charity. Why they don't do charity? Because they do not believe in the day of judgment. So here, what they say, the monafiqun, the hypocrites in, Mac in Medina, they don't only say we believe in God. No, that's not enough. They have to believe in the day of judgment as well. These two should be, uh, should be bound together all the time. So there are some people who say we believe in God and day of judgment, and they are not believers. They seek to deceive God. And this is what a hypocrite would do. Of course, they seek, they seek to deceive God. I'll discuss what that, what that means. They seek to deceive God and those who have faith, yet they deceive no one but themselves, but they do not they are not aware. They do not know that they are deceiving themselves. Now, the first thing that we have to discuss about this verse 9 is yukhadu'un Allah. Mukhada is a sort of two-way interaction, a mutual interaction. This babu mufa'ala usually in Arabic is used for mutual interaction. So mukhada'a is when I try to deceive you and you try to deceive me. That, that's how muhada happens, when two charlatans try to do business with each other. That's how things would go, muhada. Now, some people have said this yuhadi'un Allah is, uh, is very difficult to explain. They try to deceive God, and God tries to deceive them. It doesn't apply to God, of course. So they say yuhadi'un Allah means yahta'un Allah, means they try to deceive God, not just from one way, not from the other side as well. However, uh, uh, here, ma yakhda'una illa anfusaho means this muhada from the other side also comes deception because of themselves, not because God is trying to deceive them. They try to deceive, but they are deceived. So it's like a muhada, it's like a two-way mutual thing. They try to deceive, but they are deceived, and therefore it seems that someone from the other side is deceiving them as well. That's why muhada is used here. Yuhadun Allah walladina aman. Now, what is the uh, what is the main core of deception? Deception is when you have something in heart and mind, but you show something else to the one whom, with whom you are dealing, and they are deceived. This is, this is how a deception happens. Is this possible with Allah at all, or is it not possible? Well, you, you never can hide anything from Allah, and therefore there is no deception with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why does it say, this is something that the, uh, the, the exegetes have discussed here, why it says they are deceiving? Of course, in, in translation, uh, sometimes the translation is uh, actually uh, an interpretation as well. The translation of Qarai says they seek to deceive Allah, means that they are intending to do it, but they cannot, because it's not possible to deceive Allah. In fact, it is giving an interpretation for that. But the verse doesn't say that this, they seek. The Arabic doesn't say they seek to deceive Allah. They deceive, well, they try to, to, to deceive or whatever. Uh, we can say that. but. Deceiving Allah is impossible because, as I said, deception means when you have something in the heart and show something else, say something else. It's not possible about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, some exes say that here, yukhadi'un Allah means yukhadi'un Rasul Allah. They try to deceive the Prophet, peace be upon him. Yes, of course. 
We do not believe that Prophet knows every intent of any heart. It's not only when Allah reveals it to him, he knows it. Otherwise, there are many, many people, there are many, there are many people who did things that Prophet did not know the true intention of what they did. And uh, uh, therefore, for example, in, uh, 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 in uh, Surah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have that, وَلَوْ نَشَاءُ لَأَرَيْنَاكَهُمْ لَأَرَفْتَهُمْ بِسِيمَاهُمْ if we wished, we would have showed to you who these people are, what are their intentions. But it's easy. The way they speak, you can realize whether this is a hypocrite or not a hypocrite. And usually, when people go in details about their faith and what we do, and you realize that, well, these are not the true sort of uh, practitioners of faith, and especially about the prophet with that high intelligence. As soon as a person started to talk, of course he would have known uh, that uh, this, is, uh, this is not a, a true believer. But some of them were very well versed in this hypocrisy. When they speak to you, you love to talk, to listen to them. They speak in such a way that they even deceive the prophet about their faith, deceive someone who is well-versed in faith and can realize when someone is speaking about his faith, can really realize uh, whether he's real faithful or not. But sometimes they speak in a way that even the prophet likes to listen to them. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُعْجِبُكَ قَوْلُهُ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيُشْهِدُ اللَّهِ عَلَى مَا فِي قَلْبِهِ وَهُوَ عَلَدُّ الْخِصَامِ Some of the people, when they speak, you wonder, you like them to speak, you like them when they speak about God. وَيُشْهِدُ اللَّهِ عَلَى مَا فِي قَلْبِهِ And they say God is witness in what is in our hearts. But of course, they are the most stubborn enemies, uh, despite this nice talk. So some people say, Yuhadun Allah means Yuhadun Rasulullah. They try, and it's, it's, it is something common in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many places, instead of Rasulullah, he uses Allah because there's no difference. Those who uh, pledge allegiance to you, they are pledging allegiance to Allah. This is the hand of God that you are giving to them and is above their hands. So the Prophet's hand is hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet's bay'ah is bay'ah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone tries to deceive the Prophet, he deceives Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one uh, interpretation that they are actually deceiving uh, deceiving the prophet. The other interpretation is that they do something which in appearance is deception of God. They show faith, they hide disbelief, and this is what is in appearance deception of God. They try to deceive God in this way. However, what happens is that وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ So, يُخَدْعُونَ اللَّهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Of course, deceiving believers is, is easy. It was very easy to deceive the believers because the believers didn't know the intention of these people. And, of course, the most dangerous uh, uh, sort of uh, people in among the Muslim community are not the mushrikun, are the hypocrites, because it's an enemy which you are unaware of. Mushrikun is an enemy that you are aware of, you take your heat. About the munafiqun, you meet them with off guard. You don't know that they are your enemies. Therefore, these are the most dangerous ones. Uh, so they be, they deceive the believers. You have Allah, wal-ladhina amanu. But they are deceiving themselves. Why are they deceiving themselves? Because they think that by these acts, they are actually acquiring benefits. They are 
attracting benefits for themselves while they are attracting harm. Therefore, they are deceiving themselves, but they do not know that they are doing it. Of course, they didn't know that they are attracting harm. They thought that they are doing this for the benefit of themselves, their families, their wealth, whatever. However, they don't know that they are deceiving themselves in the sense that they are attracting harm rather than attracting benefits. In a way, they are the deceived ones. إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ يُخَادِئُونَ اللَّهِ وَهُوَ خَادِئُهُمْ As we have in, in other places, the munafiqun are trying to deceive God while God is deceiving them. How God is deceiving them? In fact, the whole nature, the whole creation is deceiving them because they do not actually have any regard for their creation, their soul, what they are doing, they are attracting harm for themselves, and God allows this to happen, because this is their choice. God allows this to happen, and therefore, God is deceiving them, in a sense. So, uh, why they do this? And what is their attitude? Verse number 10. فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْذِبُونَ Now this may be an interpretation for this deception which is coming to them. That Allah increases the disease of their hearts. And this is the way they are deceived. Actually, they, they think that they are deceiving God, but this is the way they are deceived. So, what is this marar in the heart? Fi marazun. We have discussed this before that qalb, ruh, aql, nafs, they are all the same, uh, different terms for the same thing. It is human soul, human real being. Nafs, aql, soul, ruh. And qalb. Qalb, of course, is a more physical sort of, has a more physical focus, saying that the, that point of connection of judgment of the soul is somehow connected as the, 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 that's a, a connection of the calculation, management, uh, and uh, uh, counting benefits and harms is in the mind, connected to the mind in a way, and we now have found how it works to some extent, but the center of judgment is connected to the heart. This is what certain people believe, or we can say the center of soul which makes the judgment is called the qalb, not the physical qalb, but qalb because it is always in turning, it always tries, it always changes, goes into different attitudes, make different judgments. So this is this is why it's called qal. At any rate, this is what we use all the time. My heart, for example, has a feeling. My heart makes this judgment. And therefore, it's used here in the same way. We, we take it in that way. Fi qulubahem maradun. Marad or illness, uh, sickness. With regards to body is when, of course, something happens to the body which... Uh, interrupts the, uh, the, the, the correct or the regular way of its working. The, the biological uh, uh, way of, the, the way the biologically the body works is interrupted if a sickness comes. This is sickness of the body. What is sickness of the heart? Heart has a function as well, not the physical heart. Heart has a function as well, and that function is to grasp, understand things which are beyond the grasp of the physical uh, world. Mm -hmm. This is the function of the heart. Now, if this is interrupted by certain things, this is the disease of the heart. Now, these things may be, may be wrong ideas and views, maybe jealousy, maybe greed, or whatever which interrupts that proper functioning of the heart, which is to take us towards God, which is to see beyond the physical realm, to see the connection of physical realm with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we call malakut. Malakut, as we have mentioned before, is when things are 
or, or, or the way things are connected to God directly without the cause and the chain of cause and effect. That's the Malakut. The Mulk is things are of course related to God in a in a process of causes and effects. This is Mulk. Malakut is when everything we see, everything is connected directly to God without this chain of cause and effect. You remember in Surah Araf, we had this verse, Afalam Yanduru fi malakut samawati wal ard. Do they not consider, do they not ponder in the malakut of the heavens and earth? Not the way it has evolved and uh, sort of uh, changed into this state from the beginning to, to now, but the way it is connected to its creator. Do they not think about that? وَمَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ And also, don't do, do they, don't do they take in the mulk, in this chain of cause and effects, in this one. And the third thing, وَأَنْ أَسَى أَنْ يَكُونَ قَدْ اقْتَرَبَ أَجَلُهُمْ And the third thing is that their life is coming to end soon. These three things, if people think about it, the three things, malakut as wal ard the way things are connected to Allah, the way things are created, the mulk, and the transient nature of one's life, one's own life, should bring us to think about God and to believe in God. These three things. That was in Surah Araf. Afalam yanduru fi malakut as wal ard وَمَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ وَأَنْ أَسَى أَنْ يَكُونَ قَدْ اقْتَرَبَ أَجَلُهُمْ فَبِأَيِّ حَدِيثًا بَعْدَ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِهِ يُؤْمِنُونَ وَبَعْدَهُ يُؤْمِنُونَ Now here, this is the function of heart, to ponder, to think, to realize. Now, this function is interrupted, is thwarted by certain things, by love of this world, by forgetfulness about death, by... Uh, by greed, by jealousy, by trying to, to, to do unlawful things, harming other people, for example. So this is the maraz of the heart. There are certain things in their heart which stops it functioning the way it should function. That's, not, that's why they cannot believe. Now, and Allah increases this disease. وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَلِيمٌ And there is, of course, a painful punishment for them. بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْذِبُونَ Because they lie. Now, this is a different uh, punishment. There is one punishment if they do not believe. There is a second punishment if they lie that they believe. So that's why it's said in the Quran, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ منافقون are in the lowest the most disastrous place of hell. Mushrikun are above them. Disbelievers are above them. Munafiqun are at the very bottom because they have two punishments. One punishment for the disbelief and the other punishment for lying that they believe. So, walahum azabun alimun bima kanu yakzibun because they lie. This is not because they do not believe. That's a different punishment. That's a different uh, scenario, but this scenario is that because they are lying, that they believe they have a great punishment. Now, the only thing that we have to discuss is what is the meaning of fazadahumullahu maraza? Allah increases that disease. This is something, of course, that Ash'arites celebrate on this verse. Yes, you see, everything is the work of Allah. Allah gives faith, disbelief, Allah increases this disease, and he punishes over it. Yes, he can do it, he's the master, he's the sole decision maker in this world, and you cannot ask him. You cannot ask him why. However, of course, uh, you know that the attitude of the Aima from Ahlul Bayt is very different. It doesn't work that way. Of course, Allah doesn't bring harm. This is an accusation against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we think that Allah brings harm to his creation, this is, of course, an accusation that we have to purify the name of Allah from that. Therefore, Fazadahumullah Maraza, even the Ash'arites have tried, like Fakhruddin al Razi, have tried to give different meanings to it. One meaning that they have said is that. It's quite different from what I mentioned about maraz. They say when, you're, when you have pain in heart, when you, have, when you are sad, you say, my heart is sick. 
And they say this sickness of heart means that sadness, that's pain which comes in the heart. And therefore, we don't think, take this maras here as disease in, this, in, in that sense, uh, for that purpose. We take it to be sadness of the heart, which is a disease in the heart. So uh, they say, fi maradun, is, there is a sadness in their heart. Why? They see the Prophet has come to this city. They were actually the owners of this city. This Abdullah ibn Ubay was becoming, going to be crowned soon as the king of Medina. And suddenly all the plans are, have gone wrong and the Prophet has come and people are making him the leader. So there is this sadness. And Allah increases this sadness by giving more and more victory to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And therefore, this sadness increases day by day. Not that, of course, Allah increases the sadness in that way, but because Prophet day by day increases in his glory, in his leadership, this sadness would increase day after day. Now, we cannot accept this interpretation, although many, of course, credible exegetes have mentioned this, because in many other places of the Quran, the, this marav and disease of the heart is actually that interruption in the function of the heart rather than sadness or other things. Therefore, this interpretation is not acceptable. The other interpretation which is given is that uh, this maraz is kof, this belief. Of course, that's completely true. This belief is a disease of the heart and it should be cured. However, initially they disbelieved that prophets is the prophet that uh, Muhammad peace be upon him is the prophet of God? Okay, that was that was a certain maras. However, after that came other injunctions that they have to, for example, pay zakat, they have to fast in Ramadan, and all these things, and this disbelief increased gradually. So initially, it was only that they did not accept the prophet and did not want to pray. Then now they do not want to fast, they do not want to pay zakat, they, and so this. This disbelief increases by the increase of takalif, of the injunction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, day after day, they find themselves in more disbelief. So this is the meaning of fazadahumullahu maraza. Uh, the other meaning, which is mentioned by the great Mu'tazali, Mufassir Abu Muslim Isbahani is that, no, Allah, you know, this is the Mu'tazali view. Allah does not do anything in this world. Everything we do is, is of course, the, uh, the acquisition of our actions, of what we do. So he says, this is a dua. This is not a khabar. This is not a statement. This is just a, a, a supplication. In, in this form. Fi maradun, there is disease in their heart. May Allah increase that disease. Fazadahumullah maraz. Yeah, that's, that's, this sentence could be read in both ways, in dua and in khabar, a statement, as a supplication and as a statement. So he says that fazadahumullah maraz doesn't mean that Allah increases that maraz. It means that uh, Allah is actually saying, may Allah increase their maras or their disease of the heart because of what they are doing, because they are so hateful. Now, our question from this uh, very credible and respectful Abu Muslim Swahani Mufassir gentleman is that if Allah makes a dua, would it come true or not? Yes, Allah says, may Allah increase their, uh, their disease. And if he says this, would he increase his, their disease or he would not increase their disease? Of course, he would. Who would increase it? It's Allah who increases the disease, certainly. So you cannot evade from the consequences of this uh, uh, dua e, e, in e, either way. So that interpretation is not acceptable as well. And therefore, we come to final interpretation which is probably the most correct one, and that is due to this disease of the heart, because they are not actually trying to cure that disease. They are acting upon that disease, and they are showing that grudge, that animosity towards the prophet. And that would increase the disease of the heart. It's just like a cancer, which spreads. 
And of course, why it is attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because everything in this world is done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, this disease, this disease of the heart, if you not cure it, if you not stop, do something about it, then it would spread. And that is what, how the munafiqun actually were uh, imprisoned in this disease and were the, trapped in this disease and the disease spread as the time passed on. So this disease spreads and spreads and spreads just like someone, for example, who has a doubt initially about God. Then this doubt, instead of trying to address this doubt, gradually says, no, I'm not going to pray as long as I have this doubt. Then, okay, it doesn't matter whatever happens because I have this doubt. So it spreads. If you do not address the disease of the heart, just like the disease of the body, if the disease of the heart is not addressed, is not cured, is not uh, with effort, if we do not try to cure it, then of course it spreads, and this is probably the meaning of فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ maraza, And uh, this disease would be increased day after day. Now, in Majma al-Bayan, uh, which is, of course, a, a Shi'i uh, interpretation. He says that this maraz is the, the, the hidden kuf that they have. And, of course, uh, the, 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 that, is the, that is the disease of the heart. And this hidden kuf would take them away from the fetra of Islam, the fetra which is in every human being. And then the more these signs of Allah, the more these communications come through. If they do not address this disease, the more they defy. I mean, for example, you may defy one sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You may define one argument and do not accept it. But as more and more argument comes and you defy more and more, therefore your disease spreads and Increases, and I think this is the best interpretation given for the uh, increase of disease by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Therefore, fi qulubihim marazun, there is a disease in their heart, and Allah increases that disease. Fazadahum Allahu maraza, walahum azabun alimun bima kanu yakzibun. Wa iraqil lahum la tufsidu fi al-ard. Qalu inna ma nahnu muslihun. When they are told do not cause corruption on the earth. They say we are only reformers. Inshallah, we'll discuss this verse next week. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alayhi tahiri. Allahumma sholli ala Muhammad wa ali. Sheikh, thank you much indeed, uh, Sheikh. Uh, brothers, sisters, we are now floor open for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, inshallah. Any volunteers on the sister's side or brother's side? Anybody? Any brothers, sisters? Sheikh, uh, over the period of these so many years, 12 years, I think, nearly, of discussion of Tafsir, we have come across the discussion there that the, this interpretation doesn't look sound or better, and then there is other interpretation that looks more authentic. So the ones that we say that are not, doesn't make sense or doesn't sound proper, how old are they, or are they still uh, sort of being interpreted like that? And then there are majority of the ulama or interpreters who say, okay, these looks more authentic. So time-wise, how do you explain that? Uh, time is not a factor here, no. Actually, it's different understandings, different mindsets, which understand differently. Certainly, for example, the Hanbalites understand the Quran in a very, very different way than the Mu'tazilites and the Shiites, they understand it. It's, it's based on the, the worldview that we have. And therefore, uh, what we always say about the, the Quran is that what we understand is the apparent meaning. And there are certain verses, of course, which are, which does, do not accept more than one apparent meaning. These are muhkamat. There are many verses which are, accept more than one apparent meaning. These are the mutashabahat, okay? And therefore, mutashabahat should be returned to muhkamat. However, how we return it to them, or how we understand those muhkamat in the first place, uh, is a, 
a matter of understanding. That is why we always need the imam, isn't it? We say that the, the, why the Prophet said in Nitarakum Fikum Ustakalain Kitab Allah wa Itrati, the book of God and my Itra, because it needs someone who has the the interpretation or the meaning rather than different interpretations and understandings, which is not based on conjecture, not based on, uh, on, on theory, based on truth. And therefore, as long as we go before the 12th Imam comes, inshallah, we have all these arguments, and that's good. I mean, we, we discuss different things. We actually uh, come to know different aspects of uh, one idea, one verse, and uh, we should not be dogmatic to think that a verse may only mean what we say it means, and therefore it's good. So it means that uh, when we say as a Shia that this interpretation looks more possible, plausible, then we are looking from the Shia point of view and maybe from the other brother's side of view, there may be a different interpretation. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yes. yes. Thanks. Uh, sisters? Thank you. Uh, in the front, surprise, and then come back. Um, Sheikh, for example, in this verse, you gave three different exegists, three different opinions of how it could, and two of them you said, well, they don't make sense, and, and we all here agreed with you. And, and I'm thinking that the people who actually made these tafsirs are phenomenally intelligent. I mean, you have to be very knowledgeable to even think about doing a tafsir. Yeah, so right. what were they thinking? If we so readily agree with you that it doesn't make sense, and it, but it makes sense to them. I, I explained it in a way that it makes sense. <laughs> if Fakhruddin Razi comes and explains it for you, he makes his own opinion to make sense for you. See, that's the point. <laughs> yeah, uh, sisters. Just to add to that, I mean, yes, of course. I mean, as I said, people had different backgrounds, and based on that background, they made these things make sense for them or do not make sense for them. I mean, if you are an Ash'ari, you know, Ash'arism is the main Sunni school of thought nowadays. Ahlul Sunnah that they call themselves now are Ash'aris, not the, not the Wahhabis. Wahhabis are not Ash'aris. But the main body of Ahlul Sunnah, they are Ash'aris. Wahhabis are Hanbalites, which do not believe in Kalam or theology or whatever. They, are, they have gone back to the very Salaf, like Ham, uh, the, the Ahmad ibn Hanbal and others in belief which they did not believe in theology, thought, reasoning at all. They did not believe in that at all. Then, of course, Ash'ari came and made the theology of uh, Ahlul Hadith more reasonable, more structured. Nowadays, of course, the Wahhabis or Salafis, as they, they, they call themselves, they do not believe in Ash'arism. But these are minority. The majority of Ahlul Sunnah are Ash'aris now. It has, it has been accepted as the main tenet of faith. Now, of course, the Ash'aris, because of their background, they interpret all these verses in a different way, and the Mu'tazilis in different ways. One very good thing about Fakhruddin al-Razi, who was an Ash'ari, of course, in his tafsir, is that he brings both arguments. He brings the argument of Ash'aris and Mu'tazilis. And sometimes he refutes the argument of Mu'tazilis, and sometimes he does not. It's seeming that he doesn't have any answer for it, for example. And, uh, so he leaves it to the person's judgment to judge for himself. And therefore, the background of people are very important. We, as Shias, have our background in the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, And of course, we are proud of that. We are confident that whatever they, whatever they teach is correct, is not based on opinion, like other schools. They're all based on opinion. But their teaching is based on truth. And therefore, when we make an assertion about the verse of the Quran based on those teachings, we are more confident, although, of course, that's based on our understanding as well of what they said, but we are more confident than other schools who just say things on opinion. Thank you, sister. Um, you Ali mentioned Ali. that uh, the interpretation of verse 10 um, as Allah wishing the disease to be increased upon them um, is one which we don't find acceptable because if Allah wished something, then he would do it, and it's impossible for that to be otherwise. Um, I remember in a previous lecture, unless I'm mistaken, that you mentioned that there are two types of will of Allah, which is the um, 
Tequini will, and then the Tashrayan. Legislative and creation. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, isn't it possible for Allah to wish something, but for it not to happen? No, because this dua, I mean, of course we have this, this type of dua in the Quran as well, like Qatalahumullah, may Allah kill them, okay? Uh, but here, May Allah increase their disease. This is not a legislation, of course. This is not a legislative will. And when Allah says this, it means that it happens. Like Qatalahumullah, they are actually killed by Allah, not physically. They are killed in the sense that their soul is killed, their, their soul is dead. And therefore, uh, this cannot be a legislative sort of thing, a legislative will of Allah. It this to us should certainly be have creational effects. And if it has creational effects, then we are back to the square one that yes, Allah is increasing their disease. Yes. <clears throat> we try to make these things easier to understand, and somehow then you think there's another angle to it. So it's like a never ending discussion, of course. I'm referring to the, um, <coughs> the Munafiqun. And then we discussed about the, um, the Wahhabi sect. Now I'm having difficulty placing them because uh, we all know about the uh, roots of Abu Sufyan and Yazid and everything that happened following. Can we classify those people as, see the trouble is this, if you say to them that they are Mushrikun, well, they were Mushrikun, yes, but then they were Munafikun from their description, and then they turned into leaders. So there's not really a heart there. There's a lot to do with brain, because they were self-indulgent people. They wanted power. So where do we put them? Because they could be from any walk of life. They could be Mushrikun. They could be from the Munafikun. But they could be actually right in thinking that the Quran can be interpreted in a different way, which is what the Wahhabis are doing now. They're saying, let's get back to basics. There are some things that we do not change. You know, we don't worship graves. We don't do any of that sort that has anything to do with anything. Allah is always there and he's in your mind. So yes, if we have a Wahhabi teacher sitting there, some of us could well, you know, try to understand and, and maybe to get taken away by that idea. So where do we place them? Are they Munafikun? Are they... Who? Uh, Wahhabis? Yes, for example, yes. No, I mean, they are, of course, they are not Munafikun. Someone who shows faith but has no belief in heart. We believe that Yazid was someone like that, of course. Of course, he could not say that I'm not a Muslim sitting in the, in the chair of the leadership of Muslim. He, was, he could not do that. Therefore, he had to show faith and... Uh, he did not believe in anything, as we have in those poetry, which is reported from him when he saw the head of Imam Hussein al Zal. This was just politics of Banu Hashem. No revelation came. So he was a Munafiq. But someone who, who believes, like, for example, a Wahhabi or a Salafi or whatever, uh, as we call them, someone who believes really in these verses, but he believes in a very different interpretation that we have, we cannot say that they are munafiq, for example. They really believe in it. But we say that they are deviated in their understanding. As they call us, we are deviated in our understanding. We say that they are deviated in their understanding. Now, what they say is, going to the origin, Salaf, and by Salaf, they may mainly mean, mean the Hanbali type of thinking, that you do not interpret anything. For example, when Allah talks about al uh, arshasta while he's sitting on the throne, you really believe that he's sitting on a throne, a physical throne. This is what you believe. How? We don't know. How? We don't know. We just believe in that. And they do not believe that, for example, the apparent meaning... Uh, actually, about this apparent meaning, uh, Ayatollah Subhani has a very, very interesting uh, uh, interpretation. He says that apparent meaning is sometimes apparent meaning of a word. Sometimes it uh, is apparent meaning of a sentence. You cannot confuse these two. What Hanbalis have done, and the Wahhabis have done, and Salafis, confusing the apparent meaning of a word 
with the para meaning of a sentence. Example, if I tell you hand, hand has an apparent meaning, a word, and this is hand, of course, physical. But if I say that such a person has an open hand, what's the apparent meaning of that? You don't go back to hand anymore. Open hand, the, the apparent meaning of the sentence means that it's generous. Now, what has confused these people is that they have confused between, between the apparent meaning of words and apparent meaning of a sentence. Yadullah hand of God is above their hands. This is an, a sentence which is clearly has a meaning, and apparent meaning is that Allah is above, his power is above all our powers. But if we say no, it says hand, so hand of God, so God has hand. So this is confusion. Now, we only can actually oppose these things, not by takfir or such things, or just by arguments. This is your, what you are saying is wrong. Every language understands there's a difference between apparent meaning of a word and apparent meaning of a sentence. And if you don't want to accept this, then we say that, with all due respect, you are stupid. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm just talking about someone who rejects this apparent meaning of a word. Of course, the argument started from saying that there are two qualities. One is belief in Allah and one is belief in the Akhirat. Yeah. You see, so is that the classification, as you said, of Muslims? Then in that case, the Wahhabis can never be called non-Muslims. No, we, we do not call them non-Muslims. No. Okay, it's very important in this day yeah. and age for us to uh, be able Just to... Just like Khawarij, we do, Imam Ali, I don't think he called them non-Muslims. Just they were somehow having very, very wrong interpretation of faith. Very wrong interpretation of faith. And this happens, of course. Wrong interpretation of faith is something which is very common in all religions. By extension, then, if this was Saudi Arabia and there were a lot of people who are going off in different ways, worshipping different stones and graves, so if uh, the order was given to stay as a takfiri would do not entertain any other type of Islam, at a particular time that might have been the right thing to do because of the deviation of sects. So. I can even venture to say that these people at the time, believing that they were doing the right thing, are actually getting their reward in Jannah. Would that be true? i leave that to God. <laughs> Why should we burden ourselves with that issue which God is going to judge later on? Sisters? You may have discussed uh, last time, and from what I gather, the, the ayats in the beginning are talking about the three kinds of people, the mushrikun, the nafaka, which is the hypocrites, and the sadikun. But in the ayat number six, it says, whether you tell them or not tell them, they will not believe. So I'm confused, then what's the point of dawah? So who is Allah referring to in this ayat? Now, those two verses, uh, this talks about those who have chosen to disbelieve, as we discussed before in a couple of sessions before this. Those who have chosen to disbelieve, you cannot do anything about it. However, we don't know who has chosen to disbelieve, who hasn't chosen to disbelieve. There are many people who, have, who do not believe but they haven't chosen to disbelieve. It's just because of wrong ideas, because of environment or something like that. So if you give da'wah, they would believe, certainly. Now, if we take the example of the time of the Prophet, for example, he just uh, extended his da'wah to everyone. But there were people like Salman, Abu Zar, Meghdad, many others who believed. People like Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan, many others, Utbah, who did not believe. Now. Prophet cannot say initially that because, for example, certain people do not believe at all, I do not extend my da'wah to them. And we don't know, actually, who chooses eventually to be a disbeliever and who doesn't. And therefore, da'wah is always open for those who want to accept. It is a very, of course, a commonplace 
fact, we all know about it, that we may call someone to faith uh, who is far away from us in, in terms of relation. They may very readily accept, like Abu Zar, who had no relation with the Prophet. But someone who is a relation to us, like Abu Lahab to the Prophet, who was his uncle, he called him, he did not accept, he did not respond. Therefore, because we don't know this, da'wah should always be done equally to everyone, and Allah then, of course, knows who will accept, who don't accept. Thank you, any sister, any, before we come back to the brothers? No, Zuhair, please. Um, it's a bit puzzling me that, you, you know, when you discuss, and it's surprising that Mufassirin as well as grammarians talk about khada as reciprocal. Um, yes, when we talk in terms of musara'a, as you mentioned, that obviously when you're wrestling with somebody, somebody's wrestling with you as well. It can't be one way. But does it necessarily have to be that? Because you have takhada'a which is clearly reciprocal, where there are two parties involved who are deceiving each other. Whereas here, the impression that I get is there is no deception coming from God himself. It is actually the trying to deceive, or even that is being debated, as you suggested, is a one-way traffic in the sense that it is the munafiq who's trying to deceive Allah and the disbelievers. And sorry, that they only deceive themselves. So the idea of trying to deceive is that they think that they are deceiving, and that is the trying part of it. But the reality of it is that they are only deceiving themselves. And to me, the third form here of khada'a is much more of a one way rather than yakhda'una. That's why they say yakhda'una means yakhda'una. That some exegetes say this, yakhda'una means yakhda'una. However, the verse that you just uh, mentioned, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ يُخَادِئُونَ اللَّهِ وَهُوَ خَادِئُهُمْ So it's, it gives this mutual, reciprocal sort of uh, uh, relation that Allah deceives them too. They try to deceive God and Allah deceives them too. Now, there is a very clear meaning for this. Yes, they try to deceive God. Now, how God deceives them by leaving them to do it. And he gives them more ni'mah. They do it, he gives them wealth, he gives them all these things. If someone looks from outside, say, what is God planning for them? They are deceiving, trying to deceive God. They say, we believe, they do not believe that. But God is giving, giving the, the way he does for any, any other person. There should be some plan there. And this is what Allah says, that they shouldn't think that what we give them is good for them. Is bad to innama numli lahum, we give them time, layazdadu isma. And this is deception. This is the meaning of deception, actually. That they think that they are receiving good from Allah while they are not receiving anything good. They are receiving what harms them. This is the meaning of deception that they say. Sorry, just one more thing. What would the difference be between takhada'a and khada'a then? Uh, <laughs> There shouldn't be much difference, khada and takhada. There shouldn't be much difference, no. Yeah. I don't know now. Fa'ala and tafa'ala, they have almost the same meaning. I, I have to refer back to, the, to, to my grammar. <laughs> to see what's the, the basic grammar that... You should know better. <laughs> yeah, you should know better. This is what's problematic, because the basic grammar that I have studied, my impression is that fa'ala is a one-way traffic. Mm -hmm. Whereas tafa'ala is reciprocal. Yeah. And, but I see, even just now when you were talking, I checked the plane and it does say that it is. No, khada has two way too. It has two yeah, way too. Two way too. And this yeah. is what's puzzling me that if that is two way as well and so is tafa'ala, then what is the difference? Why are there. No, khada. They say, you khada'oon Allah means yakhda'oon. Yakhda'oon has one. Khada is one way, okay? Khada is one way. But takhada and khada, both of them are two ways. So they say, yukhada'oon Allah. In, in, one, in some recitations, we have yakhda'oon Allah. So yakhda'oon is very different from yukhada'oon. No, I understand yakhda'oon, that yes, is yes, yes. But, but khada'a... In, in the other verse we have, that's inna uh, al-munafiqina yukhada'oon Allah wa huwa khada'uhum. So it's, it's again a two-way thing. 
Sisters. Sorry. Khada, yeah. yeah. This. You had it, oh yes. It's a file. In what that verse and the interesting thing is, in al munafirina yuhadeun Allah. That means they try to do this mutual uh, deception. Wahua khadeuhum means. Yehada, it comes only from him, yeah. nothing from here. It's not possible for them to deceive Allah. Ohum, it means that the deception only comes from that way. Thank you. That was very good. <laughs> Any sisters? Any brothers? No. Thanks, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Wali Muhammad.